Hi again, and welcome back to FSD TV. I'm your host, Mark Sunny, and we have Kim Bass with us back again to go over the book and the story, PAX. Today we've got chapter 12, and we're gonna find out a little bit about Dola. So Kim, take it away. All right, I'm back now, guys, and it's chapter 12. Gage, I think you're ready. All right, let's find out what happens with Peter. You coming in, or am I just holding the door open for the flies? Peter dropped his pack. He rebalanced himself on the crutches and stared at the log cabin. These trees grew here? It hadn't been a question, but Bola nodded and pointed uphill. Uh, spruce from the top of Mason's Ridge? Lincoln logs is what you're, what you're thinking. Sort of, but it wasn't. Peter reached out to touch one of the logs. What would it feel like to make something so, so consequential? to cut timbers and watch them fall out of a clear blue sky and roll them down to a clearing, your hands sticky with sharp scented pitch, and then to lift them into place, notched and stacked one over another. Yes, just like the toys that had been his favorite in kindergarten, the old set in the tall cup cardboard canister, and end up with a home. You built this? No, before my time. Now come in, I don't have all day. Peter still didn't move. What are your conditions? You said you'd tell me when we got here. Bola sighed and stepped back down onto the slab of granite that formed the front step, letting the screen door clap shut. She picked up a jar of seeds and a cloud of birds fluttered down from the trees to surround her. She filled a feeder that hung from a corner rafter before, return, before turning to answer him. Number one. I don't want anyone coming around here. I live by myself for a reason. You write to your grandfather and tell him whatever it takes to make sure nobody comes around here. Besides, it's only fair you let your family know you're not dead in a ditch somewhere. Peter reared back so fast that he almost toppled over. The pain that movement caused was searing, but he bit his lip. No, he'd come and get me. No. Condition number one non-negotiable. She scooped a few seeds from the jar and held out her palm. A chickadee left the feeder and settled on her fingertips. He pecked at the seeds and when they were gone she tossed him back into the air. She turned back to Peter. Number two, you're going to tell me why you're carrying that bracelet. Peter glanced down at his pack and felt his heart clench to protect what was so private. Why? because I'm curious about you, and you can tell a lot about a soldier by what he carries into battle. But I'm not a soldier, I'm just going home. Is that so? Because it sounds to me like you're headed off to fight for something in a place where there's a war. But have it your way, you're not a soldier. Condition two is this, is still this. When I ask, you're gonna tell me why you brought that bracelet with you. Why that particular thing, the truth, that's the real, that's the rule here, agreed? Peter nodded, his right foot throbbed, his left leg ached from the extra burden, and his shirt was sweat soaked from the exertion of hobbling the hundred yards from the barn, but he stood his ground. And number three, you're going to help me with something. I see that look, don't worry, it's just a project needs a second person, that's all. But I'm not ready to tell you what it is yet. She picked up his backpack. Inside, it's time to get you off that foot, and I suspect you're hungry. Mr. Not exactly running away from home, no bat Peter. Suddenly, Peter was starving. Still, he hesitated. He pivoted to look at the hills, which the sun was lightly too smoky blue. Pax was out there. He was still so far away. Bola came up behind him. Peter sensed her raising a hand toward his shoulder and then letting it fall back. I know what you're thinking she said, but you are not fit to go yet. Inside, the cabin was bright and smelled faintly of smoke. Bola tapped a pine table and Peter sat. She draped a blanket over his shoulders, then left and came back with a plastic bag full of ice cubes. She propped his foot on a chair and wedged the ice bag against it. With a washcloth, she cleaned the blood from his hand. Finally, she passed him a cutting board with a loaf of bread and a knife on it. Peter put it down. How long will it take? Depends on you, the woman pointed to the bread. 
What you can't use your hands either? Slice that up. How long? You can go when you can hike over rough terrain on those crutches for eight hours a day. Two weeks, I'd guess, six slices. You don't understand, he won't survive. Bola lowered her head to glare at Peter. She yanked her thumb to the wall behind her. Number 11. Peter twisted around. A jumble of index cards was thumbtacked to the wall. The Gulf Stream will flow through a straw, provided the straw is aligned to the Gulf Stream and not at crossroads, cross currents. He read aloud from one with the 11 scrawled over it. What's that supposed to mean? It means align yourself, boy. Align myself? Figure out how things are and accept it. You've got a broken foot. Broken. The deal is you stay until I say you're ready. I told you my conscience is stretched to its limit. So that's your choice. Stay here until I say or go back to your grandfather now. You change your mind about that? No, but... Then accept it, eh? Now slice the diable man bread. Peter started to argue, but then closed his mouth. He wasn't staying for any two weeks, but obedient and helpful was the safest play for now. He ducked his head and set to work, cutting six thick, even slices of bread while Bola slapped a chunk of butter into an iron skillet and snapped on a flame beneath it. Without turning around, she motioned to herself above the counter. Pick yourself something. Canning jars, stacked three deep, gleamed like a rainbow of liquid jewels along the length of the shelf. Peter read the plain block letters on the labels. Cherries, plums, tomatoes, blueberries, apples, pumpkin, pears, green beans, beets, peaches. Braids of dried garlic and chili peppers hung beside the shelf. You grow all this? Bola nodded, her back still to him. The trees that run along, oh, the trees that run along your stone wall are in bloom. What are they? Nearest the wall? Peaches. He pointed to a jar near the end. Peaches, he said. Please, ma'am. Bola opened a jar and handed him a fork. Uh, there's a twig in it or something. Bola reached into the jar, popped the stick into her mouth, sucked the syrup off, pitched the stick over her shoulder into the sink, and rolled her eyes. Lord Cinnamon. Mm. Eight. She gathered the bread he'd cut with a curt nod of approval. Cheddar or Swiss? Cheddar, I guess. Bola straightened. You guess, boy? You don't know? Peter shrugged and speared a peach chunk. It tasted as bright and golden as it looked. Bola seemed to be working up a whole lot more to say about cheese, the cheese issue, but then she pressed her lips together, spun around on the point of her wooden leg, and clumped out the back door. She came back in with a slab of cheese a moment later, then set to work wordlessly making sandwiches. Peter heard them sizzle as she pressed them into the hot skillet. He surveyed the cabin. It wasn't big, but it didn't feel cramped either. Sunlight flooded in through clean windows, washing the log walls with honey glow. Two blue striped armchairs flanked a stone fireplace, and a trunk stacked with books served as a table between them. Small barrels held lanterns, and more hung from the beams. There were photo photos on the mantel, a few paintings on the walls, and a basket of yarn beside the armchair. Through an open door by the fireplace, Peter saw the corner of a bed, neatly made with a yellow checked quilt. It was a surprisingly normal home for a crazy person, yet something was missing. Peter not noticed then how quiet it was. Silent, actually, except for bird calls outside and the butter sputtering in the skillet. But that wasn't it, not exactly. Hey, he said it as it dawned on him. You don't have electricity, the woman flipped the sandwiches. As far as I know, that's not a crime in this country. Not yet, anyway. Peter tried to think about what he would miss without electricity, but there were too many things to count. He chased out the last bit of peach, the fork rattling against the empty jar. Bola's back was still turned to him, so he lifted the jar to drain the last drops of syrup. But wait, how did you get the ice? I got a refrigerator out on the porch. It's gas. So, so's the stove and the water heater. I've got everything I need. She set two blue plates down on the table. Peter's mouth watered at the smell of food, but he waited. Bola wasn't finished. He sensed. I have more than everything I need, Bola said. I have peace here. 
Because it's so quiet? No, because I'm exactly where I should be, doing exactly what I should be doing. That is peace. Eat. Peter bit into his sandwich. The cheese was hot and runny all the way through. The bread fried crisp and brown. He broke off a corner out of a force of habit and was about to reach down with it when he remembered. There was no fox under the table. He wondered if Pax was missing him as much as he missed his fox right now. Don't you get lonely out here? I see people. B. Booker, librarian, Robert Johnson, bus driver. I have. I see people. She got up, brought the frying pan over, and slid another sandwich onto his plate. Eight. Peter ate, thinking about what she'd said about peace. When he finished, he licked the buttery crumbs from his fingers. What do you mean you're doing exactly what you should be doing? Do you work? Of course I work. The garden is half an acre and the orchard is twice that size. I'm planting beans and okra today. Maybe get to replacing the seal on the well pump. There's always plenty to do here. But you don't go to a job, make any money? How do you buy things? Like all those tools in the barn. Like, he waved around the cabin, all your stuff. Bola hoisted, hoisted herself onto the counter and then held out her wooden leg and wrapped it with the spatula. My country pays me a little blood money every month in exchange for my leg. She dropped the spatula into the sink and shook her head. A diable man deal. Turns out my leg wasn't all that valuable to them. Wish they'd told me that before they sent me scouting in a minefield because I liked my leg. It was a good leg. Not much to look at maybe, but it worked fine. It ran me clear into the next town when Deidre Callanan and I set fire to her father's woodshed in sixth grade and it kicked the smile off of Henry Valentine's face when he tried to grab my butt the next year. I could go on. A leg is a very big price to pay. Every day, every single day, I wish I had it back. How come you don't get one that's more? The woman stuck her leg out again and tugged up to her cuff to assess the wooden post. Oh, they gave me a prosthetic. A complicated piece of work scared the devil out of me whenever I looked at it, looked down, so I made my own. It's heavy and it's clumsy, but I did get some terrible things in the war. I figure I deserve to stra drag something around. You threw it away? A prosthetic leg? You just threw it away? Peter couldn't help imagining the shocked look on some garbage collector's face. Of course not. I wear it sometimes. Right now, it's in the garden on the scarecrow. Scares the devil out of the crows, too, apparently. She dropped off the counter and jammed a battered straw hat onto her head as if she suddenly remembered this garden of hers. I'll be back before dark. The outhouse is just beyond the two cedars, and there's a tub in the kitchen. Clean up. The porch is yours. Actually, you'll have to share it with Francois. Keep that leg elevated. Who's Francois? Again, Bola's short bark of a laugh startled Peter. She tipped her head toward the back door, which led out to a screen porch. He's probably out there napping right now, lazy old thief. She crossed to the door, looked out, and then nodded. Come see. Peter levered himself off the chair and onto the crutches. Bola held the door open and waved toward a wooden bin. Peter saw a pair of dark ringed eyes peering out at him. He cocked his head to get a better view, and the raccoon cocked his head, head back. Francois Vignon, named after one of the most famous thieves in history. The original was a poet as well as a thief, and such a charmer that every time they arrested him, some admirer pardoned him. Peter grinned. He crouched to get a better look. Hey, chuck, 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 he called softly, the way he always greeted Pax in the morning. The raccoon eyed him lazily for another moment, then seemed to decide he wasn't interesting and flopped over and closed his eyes. Is he wild or tame? Bola waved the words off as if they were gnats. I leave the porch door open. He visits when he wants to, and he's fine company. I feed him, but I don't have to. He stays fat enough on his own. We've come to a little agreement about the chicken coop. He leaves the girls alone, and I scramble him up an egg now and then. He's a companion. That's the best word. She pointed to a beam spanning the ceiling. Tomorrow, you can do some pull-ups. But today, stay off the leg and keep it elevated above your heart is best. She nodded to the refrigerator. Keep icing it on and off. I want the swelling down some so I can set that bone tonight. Mix a spoonful of willow bark in water every few hours for pain. 
Peter nodded, then dropped into a hammock hanging from the beams, exhausted. Bola started to leave, but paused in the doorway and turned around to study him. She crossed her arms over her chest, an unreadable expression on her face. What? Just wondering, she said. You staying out here on the porch? What do you suppose that makes you wild or tame? And that ends chapter 12. Thank you, Kim, and I am riveted to this story. I can't wait to hear chapter 13. We'll be back for that later. So on behalf of FSD TV, I'm your host, Mark Sunny, and stay healthy, Fullerton.